The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24 Jacob. That's 844-24 Jacob. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinske. Great guest today. It is Susie Esman from Curb Your Enthusiasm. And she's coming on despite the fact that yesterday was a very sad day. Richard Lewis, great stand-up comic, iconic stand-up comic. Uh, and one of the uh, great parts of Curb Your Enthusiasm passed away yesterday. I texted back and forth or emailed back and forth with Susie today. She said she's emotional, but still wanted to do the show. So we'll do it, Sue. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I didn't know. I thought it was 50-50 whether she would do it or not. But, uh, you know, maybe it'll be cathartic for her. Yeah, and a, and a nice tribute to uh, to Richard. Sure. So uh, we got that coming up for you. Um In the meantime, it is March, brand new month, brand new bunch of movies coming out. And uh, I thought, Sue, you pick a couple, I pick a couple, um, and I'm going to start with this one. You must, you must see Dune Part 2. Okay, I had a feeling. so friggin' good. Now, I've not seen Dune Part 2. I saw Dune Part 1. And I rewatched it last night to get ready for Dune Part 2. And it is an unbelievable movie. It's an unbelievable setup. And the movie itself now, Dune 2, is getting some of the greatest reviews ever, ever. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, I, I pulled up these notes. Um, it is, let's see, uh, it is right now at 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's 9.4 out of 10 on IMDb. That's the highest in the history of the website. It's 1.5 on Letterboxd. I mean, it is absolutely, uh, I cannot wait. Uh, Christopher Nolan saw the movie and he said this. He says, if to me Dune was like Star Wars, then Dune 2 is like The Empire Strikes Back, which is my favorite Star Wars film. I think it's just a great expansion of all that was introduced in the first one. Dune Part 2 is exploring the mythic journey, the hero's journey of Paul Atreides as he unites with uh, with the Fremen to try to... It, you know what it is? I, I decided last night as I was watching the original Dune, the first one, mm-hmm. it's a little like... It's like science fiction dances with wolves, if that makes oh, okay. any sense at all. Well, I I love dances with wolves, so... Yeah, because he's, I, I, I don't want to spoil anything in the movie, but I will tell you that the cast of Dune Part 2, uh, Timothy Chalamet, of course, is back. Zendaya is back. Josh Brolin, Dave Bautista, Austin Butler, Florence Pugh, Stellan Skarsgård, Charlotte Rampling, Javier Bardem, Christopher Walken. I mean, it is like an unreal cast, and it is a really cool world uh, that Dennis Villain, hmm, how do we say that name? Villanueva? I, hmm. I wish I could say it correctly. The director. Uh, yeah, it's, it, sound, it sounds good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm running with that. But he's created an amazing world from a novel that a lot of people thought was completely unfilmable. So this there was a original uh, original of this many, many years ago that I never saw. I never read the book. Um I was thinking, uh, I don't know if I'm going to see this, but I read the reviews also. And based on your passion for it, um, I'm, well, I'm definitely going to go see it. But I, I have to watch the first one. I didn't see the first one. Yeah, the first one is on Max or it's uh, even on demand. I watched a TNT on demand last night. And of course, I got the ears in from the uh, massage chair. So I'm completely <laughs> enveloped in this in this other world. And Nobody can talk to me while I'm watching a movie. Like, one's walking around. It's like, no, dogs. I can't see dogs. It's like, I'm locked into the movie. And it is just an incredible, staggering uh, visual feast. And 
you know, this is, some people are saying, the greatest science fiction movie of all time, Dune Part 2. Yeah, that's what I read. So how do you how do you not go see it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, what do you got for March? There's this kind of obscure film called The Fox. I don't think I know it. Okay, it's Austrian. Okay. And it's a, it takes place during World War II, and it's a story about a... Uh, a milit like an army courier, yeah. who is um, in the Austrian army, and he stumbles upon a wounded fox in the woods, okay. and he takes the fox back with him to occupied France, and they develop this relationship. And I don't know, you know me, I don't yep. really like to know too much about a film. That's all I know. But I'm looking at this little fox. It looks so much like Tucker, who I lost Aww. recently. He, and and just the fact. And then, you know, I, I actually did watch the trailer. And you see him like the fox is like on his chest and he's like kissing him. And so it's just this really. And it's based on a true story. So it's an Austrian soldier who gets a pet fox. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, leave it to you to find one of the more obscure movies of the month. My next one's actually Kung <laughs> Fu Panda 4. Oh, where'd that come from? I never heard of that. <laughs> Kung, well, if, if you missed the first three. Uh, no, I, I, I you know, I put I it can't. in there, not necessarily because I'm going to run out and see it um, right away, but the box office has been very, very slow. I think it's because of the strike. Slow in January, slow in February. So hopefully with Dune Part 2 and Kung Fu Panda 4, you're going to see a big boom in the box office for the spring. And I'm always rooting for the theaters and the exhibitors and the studios to, to successfully distribute movies. Uh, so this is one. The voices include Jack Black, Aquafina, Viola Davis, Dustin Hoffman, Brian Cranston, Ian McShane, Kiwi Kwan, uh, just some of the names that are in Kung Fu Panda 4. Now, tell me another obscure movie that you're looking forward to. Well, this is a movie that um, Carol Liefer, my good friend, who actually wrote on, was worked on Curb. Yeah. Um, she had invited me to see a screening of this film a couple of weeks ago, and I was busy and I couldn't go. It's called Arthur the King with Mark Wahlberg. No. Sounds like something that you would like because it's another animal-related story. Um. He's an adventurer race car driver, and he finds this stray dog and takes this jo this dog on a journey with him during the race. And that's all I know. That's all but you know. But it sounds really, really sweet, and I also watched the trailer for that, and it looked just looked great. Uh, you, you know, because- Wahlberg movies are very, he's been making very wholesome, heartfelt, family mm -hmm. style movies and this one sounds like i i also saw commercials for this one it looks very very nice right right well we love that book uh, the art of racing in the rain oh my god so it kind of it kind of gave well it, it's not the same thing but it it has some shades of that i think okay again i'm going to take another sharp left turn <laughs> again in the in the interest of uh box office imaginary is coming out in the month of March. It's March the 8th. This is the movie about the killer teddy bear because nothing is safe anymore. Um, pools are not safe. Um, dolls are not safe. And now teddy bears are not safe. Um, it looks very scary. It looks very creepy. There's a scene in the trailer where the teddy bar, teddy bear is like at the end of the hall and starts walking towards a guy and then just jumps up and grabs him. Now, how do you not, how do you not go for the killer teddy bear? I thought that you don't like movies like that. Well, when I say March movie preview, I'm not just thinking about myself. I'm thinking about okay. people that might be listening um, okay. and or watching. Okay. So Imaginary is going to be a really big movie. I mean, right. granted, it's not the the blockbuster that the Austrian with the Fox is going to be. <laughs> but I still think it'll be big. So I'm, I'm kind of hitting the big movies of the month, not necessarily the ones I'm the most are likely to run out and see. Do you have okay. another one? Well, you know, I actually had Dune 2 on my list. Oh, you did? I did, yeah. So you're in on Dune 2. Oh, totally. Yeah, I. it's it's a masterpiece. Uh, I mean, 
I can't say, I, Dune 2, I can't say is a mess. The first one is a masterpiece. I, it's possible that this wins Best Picture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the word. I mean, everything I read about it was just like through the roof. Yeah. So. Uh, last one I wanted to mention, this comes out March of 15th. It's called Knox Goes Away. It is uh, starring and directed by Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, He plays John Knox, um, a retiree thriller. It's a hitman diagnosed with dementia. Now, that sounds fascinating to me. That was on my list as well. Was it? Yeah, that one yeah. I think looks really cool. Yeah, I, do, I love him. You know, I mean, he's he's great in everything Michael he does. Michael Keaton is great in everything. And I think this oh. is the first thing he's ever directed. Oh, wow. And just the story. I mean, just the fact oh, that yeah. he has dementia. I mean, it's just like Who crazy. Who was I supposed to shoot? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the alternate title. Who was I supposed to shoot? <laughs> or or did, I, did I shoot you? <laughs> <laughs> did I already shoot him? Uh, those are some of the uh, movies in the month of March that are coming up. All right, so here we go. Our guest today is one of the funniest women in America. She's been a successful stand-up comic for many years. These days, she is best known for playing Susie Green on the legendary comedy series Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is now in its 12th and final season. Susie Esman is here. Susie, appreciate you being here, especially under the circumstances. My pleasure. My pleasure. So it is the uh, day as we record this after uh, the passing of Richard Lewis, who, uh, of course, was a huge part of Curb Your Enthusiasm and is one of the legendary stand-up comics of all time. How did you find out? Where were you? All, all that stuff. Uh, it was, you know, early in the morning and I got a call and um, it's it was shocking. It was just shocking. And, and you know, it, it was weird because it was Gilbert's birthday yesterday. And um, these these people, Gilbert, Lewis, Belzer, th these voices can't be replaced. They're so singular. They're they're when they're gone, they're gone. That whole mindset and that whole voice is gone, and it's so sad. It's just I've been crying for twenty four hours. I cry and then I start thinking about him and I start to laugh because he was such a fucking nutcase. Oh, oh my, my god! <laughs> oh my god! You know I. I really got to know him. I did a weekend at Caroline's at the seaport with him. Oh, years ago. Years ago. Yeah. And he invited me into his dressing room and along the the counter were like 10 bottles of witch hazel. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea why he had even one. Right. And I never I mean, I didn't want to like I didn't know I didn't know him really. So I didn't want to ask him, like, what's up with the chasel? Anyway, so he was so sweet because that particular weekend, I guess a lot of people, industry people, were uh, came to see him. And he was didn't know whether to tell me because he didn't want me to be nervous of yeah. who was in he the was crowd. He was very kind in that way and very considerate. He was. He really but was. But he did. He said to me, um, all right, Letterman's here tonight. And he says, oh, my God, maybe I shouldn't tell. Like after you would tell yeah, me, yeah. maybe actually goes into his neuroses. And anyway, it was the most incredible weekend I ever had as a comic, just because I was with him the entire yeah. time. Yeah. 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 We did a lot of road gigs together, you know, and he was so crazy in these gigs. Like he I, I would go on first and um, he would like he wouldn't. He would have to drive up to the backstage right before I was getting off. They would like to let him know she's got the light. He couldn't be in the room before I, you know, while I was still on. And then he would like enter as I was walking from outside. He would enter as I was walking off the stage. He had so much Michigas and so many little idiosyncrasies that he would have to follow in his stand up. Oh, and then he would lead me. We would do these gigs. Uh, I remember we had one gig in Boston. It was a private. And on the hotel phone, he left me literally a 45-minute message. <laughs> literally. I'm not exaggerating. A 45-minute message. And it was just, well, you know, I did it. But, you know, I, I love you. And I did it. But I, I felt like the audience was this, like just on. And, I just, and it was just like, it was insane. It was insane. Was he was he like obsessive? Like after he did his set, 
Did he question whether it was a good yeah. set or a bad yeah. set? Did the audience like him? Oh, he did. And even and even you were there, so you probably saw that he pretty did. If he even if he had like an amazing set, he still questioned. Yes, it. yes. So do I. I mean, I. Oh yeah, we all. I guess we, we all, all do. do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he didn't um, do that. He didn't do that on Curb. I mean, at Curb was a different thing. That was just pure joy for him. And mm-hmm. um, you know, it, I guess it was it was just about three weeks ago we had reshoots. Uh, for episode 10 and he was there and you know his health was so precarious that we never knew if he was going to make it he was there and he looked great he looked really really great and he was strong and um but you know the parkinson's is such a debilitating my my brother has it and i see how debilitating is you don't get better yeah my my brother has it too oh really yeah Yeah. it's it's really a tragic disease yeah and you, you know so I don't know. I mean, I, I, who am I to say? But maybe it was a blessing. I, I don't know. I, what was he like on the on the set when you were shooting Curb? Well, you know, uh, he and Larry, uh, to watch the two of them was, I, I think that Larry loved him more than any friend he's ever had. There was a bond between them. You know, I mean, everybody knows the story. They met in camp when they were like 11 and they hated each other in sleep boy camp. And then they met again at the at the bar at the improv. And they were like, oh, you were that obnoxious guy. Oh, you were that obnoxious guy. And they became friends and like such great friends. Like from that moment on, they never stopped being friends. And they were so different. I mean, Richard, Richard was such a hipster. You know, and Larry is like the anti-hipster. You, you know what I mean? So, I mean, <laughs> Richard was always like the cool cat with the the Lenny Bruce and the he had, he, Hendrix played him on. And, you know, he loved music and. Larry would have none of that. You know, Larry was a complete opposite of that. And yet there was something about them. They were born three days apart in the same hospital. They were like brothers in a way. And um, just one of the things that I know that Larry loved so much about having Richard on curb was that he could say anything to him. He could say whatever he wanted to him. And there was no hurt feelings. It was no, you know, so it, it the relationship between them was so um funny because they had that freedom with each other like last season I, I i think he says to him at one point they're sitting and he says to him when are you going to die remember that scene he says and when are you going to die the people are like oh that's so harsh it wasn't harsh it's lewis <laughs> right 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 well there was even that scene i think it was episode one this year where richard was saying i'm going to leave you all my money yeah and larry was like i don't want you to leave me all my money um and it was i, I mean it almost felt like because it it almost felt like foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, he has not been well. He has not been not not that I expected him to die anytime soon, because he wasn't in that state. But I mean, he's had the, the past three years. He's had four different sur- He had back surgery. He broke his hip. He had t- two shoulder surgeries, and and I I don't know uh, if the Parkinson's preceded that and caused it or if. It, that I don't know how that developed, but, you know, Parkinson's, is, it's a neurological disorder and it manifests itself in so many different ways. So maybe that had to do with this falling. And I don't know. I, it yeah. was just it was just tragic and sad. And he was I just loved him. I loved him so much. Yeah. You know, I was I was actually shocked because I don't know if you if you know about this, but I'm doing a documentary on Silver Friedman. I didn't know that. So I uh, had Judy Orbach, who's dear friends yes. with him, uh, contact him. And, and I mean, I probably could have called him myself, but I just didn't feel comfortable. So she called him and asked him if he would do it. And, you know, I knew he had Parkinson's. I watched his podcast. He looked great on his podcast. Um, he didn't like you couldn't see that like any symptoms of, of the Parkinson's. It yeah. really didn't bleed through on his podcast. So. Um, he said, absolutely, I would do anything for Sue. I'd do anything for Silver and her kids. So we did the podcast. Uh, we did we did the interview. And he couldn't have been more gracious. And I'm um, watching him. And like, you wouldn't even know that he had Parkinson's when you were really? talking to because, him. Because you could tell a lot when he was working on set. Okay. But, you know, it's day to day, some of these things. Right. He, right. he would get, you know, in Parkinson's, you get that, that. Uh, that frozen face thing which is so disconcerting um and his uh, i you know what i remember uh, two seasons ago when he came on set and i saw him walking and i was like oh shit he's got parkinson's yeah I'm like how do you know i said i know that walk it, it, it's my that brother shuffle that, that kind of shuffle. shuffle yeah right yeah 
and the, just the symptoms. So it, it's just, I don't know. It's just so sad. It's just so, so sad to lose that voice. What do you think made him such a, an iconic uh, voice? Uh, what what made him a legendary comic? Well, he just rip, ripped himself open. You know, I was, I was reading some things yesterday uh, in obit, different obits, which are always interesting. I love obits. They're fascinating to me. And people were saying something about, you know, he was the neurotic Jewish guy, you know, with the bad mother. And they, they compared him to Woody Allen. And I was like, he, he is so different from Woody Allen because Woody Allen's stand up was really, really tight. And uh, every every um, every pause was planned. Lois would just go on stage with his reams of notes and just go out there and just you know, rip his soul open and just expose himself to an audience. He was, and he was also really, really funny. I mean, that's that's a given. But he was fearless in that way, how he would just turn himself in and make fun of himself and just and just rip open his heart in front of an audience. By the right, way, that's right. what I remember so much, Sue, when he came in and did our show in New York, was the sheer number of notes. Because <laughs> we had people in there all the time and they'd just roll in and goof around and roll out. And Richard had, you know, they were all laid out, these multiple pieces of paper with his notes on. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Well, just, he did uh, that when, when he did Carnegie Hall, he had his notes on stage with him. That was his thing. And, you know, yeah. th there there are the purists who would say that was, you know, that's there's something wrong with that. It, I, I always did that too, so that didn't bother me. Well, it really became part of his his act. I mean, he had that scroll that went on forever. He was the only comedian I knew that that um, had in his probably in his writer that he had a piano on stage, not to play, but to keep to to, to keep his to place notes. his notes. I mean, which was <laughs> just crazy. But you know, I think I I don't know how many people realize what an amazing actor he was. We had um, Anthony Michael Hall on who. Uh, uh, directed and starred in that series, Dead Zone, the Stephen King series. Mm -hmm. And Richard played this like abusive shot. Oh God, Susie, you have to see it. It is brilliant. He plays this abusive shock jock. Ah. And it was fascinating to see him as such a dramatic actor. And I know he did that film years ago. What was it? Diary of a... Of a, a yeah. Whatever. He, he, he was an alcoholic, which yes. he really was. In, he, in, was. In, yes. he was. Yeah. Um, and, and that was but, great. But many years. So he was sober since 1994, uh, I think. And would tell you. There's yes. things Richard would tell you constantly. I, I'm sober since 1994. I sold out Carnegie Hall in 1989. I, you know, <laughs> like he had his, his litany of things that he would just tell you over and over again. <laughs> um, how are all comics, is, is part of it being neurotic? You know, I don't know if neurotic is the right word so much as uh, I think, and Sue, tell me if you agree with this or not. I think comedians see more than other people. I think that, that we that somehow we don't have the same filter and we see more than other people, which is why we're able to take those things and then put it into our own thing and, and, and spit it out. And then people are like, Oh yeah, that's right. I never thought of that. Or, or, or yes, I, I think the same thing, but I didn't look at it from that angle. We put it through the comedic prison, and I think that that maybe that's neurotic. I, I don't know. What do you think? I th I think that um, and and you tell me what you think about this. I feel like in all the years that I did stand up, and and it still carries with me to a certain extent in whatever I do creatively today. Um. My mind does not stop. Right. I mean, right. anytime I see something, and especially when I was doing stand up, it was always fodder for something I can do on stage. Like, yeah. how can I turn that? And I, we had Stephen Wright on not that long ago, and, and we were talking about that thing, like, you know, that, that notebook by the side of my bed. Well, you that's know, what I that, mean when I say we see more. We because see more. We aren't seeing that. You're right. seeing it, and right, and and Larry and Richard, Larry, Larry especially, always has the little notebook. Now he does it on his phone, which is kind of weird to me. But he always had this little brown notebook that he would, you know, have. And Richard also. But yeah, we, I, I think that the, everything is material to us. Right. Like back in the day, I had uh, uh, bar napkins 
and yeah, matchbook yeah, 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 covers. Too. I mean, anything that you can write on, I I would write down like a word. Scrap. You know, it was scraps, whatever. And that was what was in my drawer. Yeah. You know, and you know, just just loose. You know, and then and then you look through. You'll have no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> I, I was like, what 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 is this? Uh, uh, you know, uh, keyboard on the computer. I have no idea what I was thinking about. But uh, are we more neurotic? Maybe, maybe. Richard certainly was. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well. Also, when you think about it, I mean, you know, we got on stage naked. You know, it's not like we were part of a band, or even you were part of or like a comedy team. You were up there by yourself, and you know. I guess if you're a musician, you probably maybe know if, you know, you're not having like the greatest set. But a lot of times the audience may be talking a little bit or, you know, whatever. But a comedian, it's like, you know, know, it's all you by yourself. And you got to get that laugh every 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever it is. And, you know, if you're singing, you sing. Right. You know, it's not the same thing. I, I always was envious of musicians by what because I always had such a horrible stage fright. What an easy time they had. You know, yeah, maybe you don't hit the note. Maybe you're flat. But you got other people. You got a, a guitar player behind you and a keyboard right. and, you know, they'll, they'll fill it in. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And if you're performing in a bar, they're dancing anyway. Right, right. We uh, Listen, I performed at many a bar, those Jersey gigs we have to oh, do. God. Remember those? <laughs> We would have to stand up on a bar and do stand up. Some bar in New Jersey on a Wednesday night. And the men would be like, show us your tits, you know, that kind of crap. Well, I remember doing a gig once when it was at the time when disco was kind of like easing down and comedy was on the rise. So, well, like 78, 79, somewhere like that? 79, 80. And there were uh, rooms that still had the disco ball, they hadn't, they hadn't taken it down yet. And you would be on stage, and they would have the disco ball, yeah, going while you were performing. It was like we performed. I mean, I, when I look back at some of the shitholes that I worked in, but that's what you learned. I mean, it made you really tough. And and in the beginning, I you know, I you probably did the same thing. I would take any first of all, I needed the money, but I would take any gig imaginable, and you learn from it. That's that sure. toughens you, right. Right. So what was it like on the shooting the what, what I guess is going to be the final season of Curb? It was it was a little melancholy in, in a way. You know, we knew from the beginning, I knew from the beginning that it was the final season because I had had extensive discussions with Larry about it. Um, you know, I, I, I have little protective measures that I do for myself. So I think that because I knew that it was the end, I kind of like pull myself back and don't allow myself to get too caught up in it, you know, just as a protection. Um, but, you know, it just, I, I've been asked this so many times over the past two weeks, is it really the end? Is it really the end? He said it before. First of all, with Richard dying, I know it's really the end. But even before that, it just feels done. I can't explain why. We've been doing it for 24 years. We've done 12 seasons. It just feels done. It just right. feels like the, is, does Larry have more ideas? I'm sure he does. He's a font, you know, they just pour out of him. But it just feels finished. It just feels like, okay, we've done as much as we can in this particular format. How many more crazy outfits can I put on? And how many more ways can I come up with to, to say, get the fuck out of my house? Yeah, you know, it just, not that- Yeah, you've run out of hats at this point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, if he called me and said, we're, we're doing another season, I would be there because there's no job that's more fun than this job. Because I am part of the creative process. I get to improvise and, and do it, you know. But uh, it just, it's been an amazing run. Uh, not to sound like treacly, but I feel incredibly privileged to have been a part of this show for all these, just really lucky and privileged to have been a part of this show all these years. And it's 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 over. Yeah, yeah. What do you, uh, what do you foresee uh, Larry doing in the future, you know, I don't know, and I've been thinking about that. He'll do something because he can't not. You know, he can't just play golf all day. I mean, he can for a little while, but he'll come up with something. He'll, he'll. I don't know what he'll do. He'll come up with something, and I just hope he includes me. Yeah, whatever it is. What, what uh, you know, it's interesting right now. A lot of things. I, I guess it's good to leave people wanting more, because uh, I would watch Curb 
I'd, I'd watch another right. 10 seasons. And we, Steve, we have not jumped the shark yet. Nope. No, you know, not at all. Oh, so let's just get out while the going's good. Yeah, yeah. Are you, um, a- as you look back at it, do you have a sense for what what your best moment was on the show? Like what what's the, if I was to say, show me the best, your favorite scene. Oh God, I, I, I don't know. I have so many. I mean, you know, there's some, cla- like I love the ski lift where I have to pretend to be Larry's orthodox wife. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, lo- I mean, just a situation, it, it, you know, Curb is a true situation comedy because it's all about the situation. It's not about the, the lines because there are no lines. Um, I love the doll from season two because that yeah. kind of established <laughs> the relationship and I had that spaghetti Western theme music. But there've been, I mean, from this season, I had a, things that I loved. It. We just have, as soon as on the show, you see how much fun we have. We just have to so much fun. Right. And were there times where you would go to Larry about just ideas, like situations for the show, like whether it was a runner or, or just something no. to include? No. There, never. A couple, there, there's a, a couple of, <clears throat> you know, over the years, there'll be, Stories I might have told him that might have been included, you know, just things that I, but not nothing that I ever said, this is a pitch for the show. Mm-hmm. They might just be things, stories that I've told him about my life or things that have happened to me that he might have included. But no, I never pitched the show. I felt so, um, just so, you know, it, one of the reasons why I love doing the show so much is because I completely and totally trust Larry's comedic vision, you know. So if and and it's incredibly freeing because if he sets something up, I know it's going to be funny. I don't have mm-hmm. to think about being funny. I just think about being in, in in the character, in the relationships, in the scene. So I mean, I'm working with the man who's a genius. I don't have to pitch him anything. He well, you know, fine without me. But you know, there there are so many times since the show's been on the air, and it's kind of become part of I yeah. think most people's lives to say it's so curb esque. Like so that curb-esque. is such a curb thing. I had a friend during, um, I guess it was after Hurricane Katrina. He held um, this event at his house where he had people come and donate clothing, and you know, mostly clothing. And he told me a story about how some guy who he had lent a shirt to, had brought that, that shirt, shirt. <laughs> and put it in the box. And then he said to me, can I take the shirt back and like wear it? And I said, well, what if you see the guy? He's going to be like, I can't fucking believe this guy. Like, but is taking shirt. I know, but he's taking, but the guy would, the guy, I think the guy didn't remember that, that he lent him the shirt. Well, you and know, so you bring up a very important point here. That almost all of the things that go on in Curb are moral dilemmas. Yes. Oh, absolutely. But he said to me, what if I wear the shirt? And I said, well, you can't. And I was like really getting in, in, involved in it. And I said, you can't because he's going to think that you just held this to get clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it would, nice. Why not take it out of the bank? <laughs> well, but yeah, there's always the the ethical and the moral dilemma. And I hate to say this because Susie Green does not agree with this, but Susie Essman, um, Larry's almost always right. Yes, yes. He's yes. almost always right. Yeah, I mean, that's a part of it. I mean, he says the stuff that we all wish we could say a lot of the time. I mean, he... Yeah. He, I, I was thinking about it. There's an episode this season where uh, the neighbor lost his father. And then Larry I found the out. I'm tree. Yeah. Yeah. And the the neighbor found it was it was really his father in law. And right. Larry saw the degrees of that. And, and of course, like, you can see yeah, anti father in law. <laughs> but it's so but bad. it's not something you say. But I, I we would think it's it. true. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I think that's his. That's the appeal of the show is that he's saying. I mean, for my character also, it, I, I think I'm acting out people's anger for them. But I think Larry is saying what people think. You know, I mean, he he used to say to me. He aspires to be that character because he's not like that character. I mean, Mm -hmm. Mm Sudo's. He's the sweetest, you know, most generous. Um, But that he does think those things, but he knows better than to act it out. But he aspires to be able to say, you run into him in the street and you say, let's have lunch. He aspires to be able to say, you know what? We're not going to have, I don't want to have lunch with you. (laughs) Instead of exchanging the numbers and the emails and the text, the book, well, you know, he aspires to be that person, but he's not. He's, He's actually incredibly sensitive to how he makes other people feel 
Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, I was well, going to say, you know, the uh, the thing about Curb is that, you know, I do a radio show five days a week on ESPN, and it's unbelievable the number of times we reference an episode of Curb. I mean, yeah, we yeah. we literally always have the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme song that will play <laughs> when we have an ethical dilemma where we've <laughs> got to make a decision. I mean, the impact of the show is just, I, it, it goes down as one of the... Probably, I mean, for me, probably one of the five greatest shows of all time. And that includes things like The Sopranos and Breaking Bad and all that. But I mean, it's it's right there in that you know, category. You you look at, at Larry and, uh, you know, I mean, this is a man who co-created the most successful television show and comedy in history in Seinfeld. And then he follows that up with Curb. I mean, it's just brilliant that he was able to have that very few people have a second act like that. That's yeah. even more, uh, from my opinion, even more brilliant than the first. Part of that is HBO and what he, you know, content, what he's allowed to do. But uh, I, I just think, you know, he's he's just he's just remarkable. And and the reason why I think that Larry is a genius, and I don't say that lightly, is because when I get the outlines in the beginning of the season and I read them, and I have comic brain, I know comedy, and I have a comedian's brain. I read those outlines and I have no idea how he got there. It's transcendent. And that's what I think genius is. It's transcendent. You can't figure it out. Like we can't hear what Mozart heard. It's like, how right. do you hear that? You know, and, and I put Larry in that category and I, I don't say that lightly or glibly. I mean, I, I really do. Having worked with him for the past 24 years, um, his, his level of creativity and his level of focus. Sometimes I'll be on set with him. I'll have an entire conversation and then I'll just look and I'll say, you didn't hear a word I just said, did you? No, he did. His head is always in the comedy. His head is always in the comedy. So yeah. how much of the ad lib, because I, I, obviously you're working from an outline and there's there's ad, how much of the ad lib do you do until you get the thing you're going to use? In other words, what what? Yeah. How, yeah. how long do you talk in a scene until you get what you winds it's up on the show it's different steve it's always different you know sometimes we find the scene very quickly in the first uh, we've had scenes that we found in the first the first scene the first take uh usually i would say it takes us about six seven takes to find the scene and then we're like okay this is the scene and then we we just do it and we don't repeat necessarily the same exact things you know i always try to throw new things in there to surprise everybody and have fun with but you know, it's 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 we have an outline. We know how it begins. We know how it's going to end and we know what has to happen. But there's no dialogue and we just kind of figure it out. We just figure yeah. it out. It's I, so much fun. I mean, you know, when I did it, um, it was the same thing. I a guess. lesbian. <laughs> lesbian. Yes. Yeah. Cause... For years, I thought Sue was a lesbian. Well, I, yeah, I was... just assumed. He actually said to me, this is how I find out. Yeah. Um <laughs> So I remember in one of the takes, I called him a fraud because that that was the that was a scene where he yeah. was uh, against the lesbians, right? Yeah. After yeah. he had championed the lesbians, yeah. And I called him a fraud, and then after the take, he he said, um, "Don't call me a fraud." <laughs> I said, "Okay." He yeah, didn't, he'll... He didn't want to be perceived as that, and yeah, I said, yeah. "No, I, I totally get it." He'll, yeah, he'll do that, and a lot of times he'll just let you go, and then he'll end up cutting it. Um, mm -hmm. But but he says that. I don't know the percentage, but I, I think like he says, like 98% of the time, the actors come up with stuff, better stuff than he could have come up with. Maybe two to 5% of the time, he wishes he had written it. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I, I heard- It also a... depends on who, who the actor is. I mean, every now and then we get some duds, you know. Right. In fact, I, I heard Blitzky. something you, I heard something you and, uh, and Joy Bayer were talking about. I think Anne Bancroft uh, was somebody that, couldn't couldn't do the improv or didn't want to do it. Well, I think she was the way everybody else, or, or she was afraid of it or something. But which, which is so ironic considering who she was married to. Yeah, who was like yeah. one really? of the great improv people. You know, she told Joy that she was intimidated by it. A lot of actors, you know, he hires mostly comedians, and we know how to do that kind of stuff. But a lot of actors are used to being given a script. But then a lot of a lot of people that come on who were. Amazing actors. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, Clive Owen just came into my head. Brilliant actor. He was 
perfectly fine improvising. He loved improvising. He had so much fun, you know. So, so for a lot of a lot of actors, it's just this this playing. We just play, and they enjoy it. But some have a hard time. I'm not. Well, kidding. you know that you know the 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 whole Atlanta you know story that developed early on um, when all these celebrities were championing what he did with the water, and Bruce Springsteen came on, and yeah. and I and I wondered, did I mean, do you know? I mean, did Bruce Springsteen really ad lib that? Uh, you know, I wasn't there that day, but I think, I think he probably did. I think he was given some parameters Mm -hmm. and he, and he did play with it and ad lib it, but I don't know for sure on that one. Right. Right. Yeah. So what's it feel like to have been part of a show like this? It feels great. It feels great. It feels, you know, look, you know, I mean, when, when we started out, we, we worked our asses off being stand up comics, right? So. I mean, we just, it's like we were out every single night. People don't understand. It, that we didn't take nights off. We were in clubs every single night, working, working, working. And to have been given this opportunity to work with Larry and to, and, and this part that, that he, well, we created the part together, really. You know, I, it was kind of, you know, that we've never discussed the character in all these mm. years. We've never discussed the character. We just, it just kind of evolved. And it's, it's been, I mean, again, I don't want to sound treacly, but it's been a complete privilege. And I feel, how did I get so lucky? I got so lucky to be able to be on this show. And people say, well, you were talented and you delivered. Yes, but even so, I still got lucky. Who, how lucky that he came back after season eight, after a six-year hiatus. And how lucky, I never knew from year to year if I was still going to be in it. You know, I just feel incredibly lucky and just yeah. grateful. And it's like, Larry... I just love him. I, I love him so mm. much. He's yes. He, you know, you know what I, I love so much about Larry? You talk about gracious. Um, and I don't know if we talked about this last time you were on the on this on the podcast, but in between takes, we were both practicing our golf swings, right? Ah, yeah. So at one point he he's like, you know, he's doing air golf and he says to me, um, you know, I uh, I think I used everybody. I think, uh, yeah, I think I used everybody. And basically what he was saying to me yeah. is that all the comics that he had worked with over the years, he used. That's and right. that's what I, and, and that was something that was so important to him. Very to important. That. He is, the, the thing that people don't know about Larry is he's the most loyal person I know. I mean, he is so loyal and he has brought people in I mean, sometimes to a fault, he's kept people that shouldn't be, he shouldn't have kept just out of his loyalty. Um, but he he really uh, has an affinity for comedians and has an affinity for all, all of us that he came up with. I mean, we were a little behind him, but even so, and he tried to use all those people at the Improv and Catch and all those comics that he worked with. And uh, yeah, he's like that. He's just like that. Well, listen, congratulations on just an amazing, amazing run, an incredible show. Being part of that show, uh, I mean, that's like career defining, right? I mean, just a, amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, it, it, it to- I mean, it made my career. I wouldn't, oh, have yeah. had, I wouldn't have had a career. I mean, I would have had a different career, but not this large of a career and great of a career if it had not been for Larry. That's for yeah. sure. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's like show biz lotto. Really? Yeah, exactly. That's why I feel so lucky. I feel so incredibly lucky. And and to also have been, look, you know, at a certain point, you know, in, in 1998, 99 or whatever, if somebody would have given me some really crappy sitcom on CBS that was going to last for seven years, I would have done it because I needed the money, you know, but to have then instead of that to have been on this show mm. that you would I would actually watch and I'm proud of. It's just been incredible. And I know we went back and forth a little bit this morning about I uh, appreciate you coming on too in light of uh, of Richard's passing and I think very uh Let very me nice thing about Richard. Yeah. Richard loved the accolades. And mm-hmm. Richard, if he could hear us now talking about him, he'd be so happy. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm glad to hear well, that. It's it's great to toast him today. Yeah. Yeah. Susie, yeah. thank you so much. We thank really you appreciate you. All righty. Bye-bye. Love you. All right. There you have it. Susie Espen joining us. By the way, Susie is doing a podcast called The History of Curb Your Enthusiasm. She's doing it with Jeff Garland. 
Uh, it is available on Apple and on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. So we wanted to make sure you knew about that. Um, I, was, I was glad she came on today. That was very, very sweet. She was she she was wavering a little bit this morning, but I was I was glad that she uh, she decided to come on. It was a nice tribute, I think, to Richard. Yeah, yeah, and I think it was probably cathartic for her to come on and do this. And and like she said, you know, <laughs> Richard, wherever he is, if he can hear this, he'd be glowing just to hear yeah. everybody talking about him and praising him. Yeah, yeah. We I think we did fifteen minutes on him on the on the radio yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He's he's a legend. Um, all right. So if, if you're listening right now on Apple or on Spotify, please subscribe to the show and leave us a five star rating and a positive review. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and then scroll down and leave us a comment, a uh, re- review or anything, snarky joke, whatever you got. Uh, all this stuff helps us to grow the podcast. And Sue, I did something really stupid. I'll, I will replace it um, with something we do today. Uh, but I did a TikTok video. Do you remember doing a TikTok video with me? I do remember. Okay. So I had my earbud in, so nobody could hear the you part of it. They could only hear me and then saw you not talk, or talking, but not hearing anything. So I got mocked relentlessly for that because I'm just learning how to use TikTok. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's for the kids. So I yeah, it's for it. the kids. We're trying to reach that kid audience. Mm-hmm. But the, and and I'm sure eventually you'll do a funny dance, right? No, I'll never do a funny. Dance. You'll never do a funny dance. No, no, that's what the TikTok's all about. Yeah, well, funny dances. So, sorry, maybe 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 a chair dance. Maybe chair dance. Okay, there you maybe, go. Maybe maybe. Um, all right, there you have it. There's the Culture Pop podcast. Thanks again to Susie Yesman. Thank you very much for watching and for listening. And we will see you next time on the Culture Pop podcast. <laughs>